Inside the Mainframe is a weird album that I go back and forth with a lot. In some ways, I think it's kind of where I really started to hit my stride as an artist. I think it's one of my riskiest and one of my most creative. I don't actually know of any other albums out there that do the particular kinds of things that Inside the Mainframe does, at least in this way. While still mostly a down-tempo and ambient-centric release, and one of my more chilled-out releases in general, I think it owes more to my love of, like, prog rock and psychedelia than any other. I think it has a really interesting blend of influences. That said, there is one giant sticking point with this album that I imagine is going to be a love-it-or-hate-it kind of thing, and that is its length. I mean, it's not my longest album anymore, The Spiral Out of Control is longer, but that's a double album specifically designed to be spread out on two CDs. Inside the mainframe, the way it is on all the digital platforms, cannot be put on a standard CD because it does not fit. It's over a hundred minutes long, and when I was burning this CD version here, I had, to I had to edit it down a fair bit since most CDs only fit 80 minutes of material. And it's not because there's a lot of tracks either, like Spiral has 22 tracks, so you already know it's gonna be long, but this only has 12. All the tracks themselves are ridiculously long. There's four tracks that break the 10 minute barrier, uh, more than any other album I've had. There's three tracks here that don't break the six minute barrier. Even the shortest track, The Cliff, is four and a half minutes, not exactly stuff you're gonna find on the radio. And not to mention a lot of these tracks were cut down from even longer original cuts of tracks, like uh, when I first made Skyride, it was almost exactly ten minutes, and the first version I did of Unspoiled View went on for sixteen minutes. I mean, I've already heard from people who told me they didn't like older tracks of mine like Alfalfa and Silent But Smelly because they ran on too long for their own good. I imagine those people are not gonna have a fun time with Inside the Mainframe. I can see some people making the case that this album is basically my Be Here Now or something, an album that wears all its ideas into the ground and creates for an, a tedious and unfulfilling listen that nobody really wants to sit through all the way through. I can perfectly understand if this album's length is a major turnoff for some people. It can be a bit much, even for me, depending on my mood these days. But, I don't know. I'm still pretty proud of the way it turned out. This isn't an album that pummels you with repetitive noise for an hour and a half. It evolves and changes a lot more, and even in the moments where it does get a bit repetitive, I think it creates some pretty cool vibes. It's long, but it's not over the top. And perhaps most importantly, I think this album is the point at which each individual album of mine creates an experience that really sets itself apart as its own thing in an obvious way. I like the idea of being the kind of artist where each album of mine will give you something different, not the kind of artist who will give you the same formula over and over. I think this was the first album I uploaded after setting up my Bandcamp page for the first time too. Previously I'd make a bunch of sessions or mini albums every year and then like around 2012 I would put together all the 256 Pi albums by taking all my favorite tracks from each year. Inside the Mainframe was the first one where I felt like I was going a bit further than that. I mean, the method was still the same. I, I had three sessions that went into this album. One called Blue Sunshine and another uh, two-parter session called Infinity Minus Two. But when I was putting this together, I was really thinking harder on how I could get all these parts to fit together as a whole outside of just being a collection of my favorite tracks from that year. I wasn't thinking on that level when I made Marble Jar, it just happened to work out well for me almost by pure coincidence. But I mean, like, this one I was putting together a, like, a little continuous mix, kind of like the one on ATB's No Silence. As in one that's kind of, that does have clear beginnings and endings, but mixes the tracks together with field recordings and the like. Additionally, the long tracks on here were definitely a big point of pride for me at the time, and not purely because they were long for the sake of being an ego booster for me to say I could make long tracks. For instance, the year previous, in 2012, I made a 23 minute 7 part suite called Don't Move It There, and a 58 minute 11 part suite called Parallel Universe. I still admittedly quite like the former, I like Don't Move It There, but I was really trying hard to go bigger and longer. It took a lot of effort to get it up to that length. And Parallel Universe, the 58 minute version, just flat out sucks to me now. It felt more like an experiment into how much padding I could put into a single track without it getting boring. 
I tried using every single loop that came with one particular library and it is really hard to get through now. It was a good lesson for me though, to show me that length is not necessarily everything. The reason the 10 minute plus pieces from inside the mainframe were big points of pride for me is because I got them that long without specifically trying to. They got to that point just naturally and organically. Even when the tracks were based off of like demo songs, like, in fact, a lot of the tracks from the Infinity Minus Two sessions were directly based off of these demo songs. Back in the day, there used to be uh, this site called Acid Planet, I guess meant to promote the software I typically use, Acid Music Studio, and every couple of weeks, they'd upload a free pack of loops to put together into a demo track. They called these 8-packs, because I guess they started out using only 8 loops each, but the ones I downloaded had a lot more than those. But yeah, these demo songs were just like 2 minutes each, though. They, I was making new versions of them that extended them out, maybe added a second part that wasn't really in the original. Now I've done extended versions of demo songs that came with Acid before. Deep Zone from Dark Clouds, for instance. Uh, those aren't per huge personal highlights because of that background, they don't totally feel like my own track. But the extended 8-pack demos I put together that year felt so much more like my own thing. Like, my arrangements were the way, were the way they originally should have been put together in the first place. I'm totally reeking of egotism here, but you... <laughs> Two tracks from this album are extended 8-pack demos that I didn't even bother to change the title of, Paving the Way and Unspoiled View. However, those are two of my biggest favorites from the album. Paving the Way has a pretty clear second part tacked on at the end, but god, I just love the way it plays out and keeps you interested for the entire 10 minutes with its jazzy flute sections, then its rock sections, and later the more old-school house section I added. It doesn't feel like a demo track that got extended outwards, it feels like it goes so much further than that. An Unspoiled View, that track went from being kind of awkward and forgettable in its original 2-3 minute hour incarnation into this giant epic buildup that flows between its various sections super smoothly, you might not even always notice, but not to the point of getting repetitive or stale. It just keeps me totally on the edge of my seat the whole time. I think Unspoiled View is even my favorite track on the album because it's a great indicator of something that you can only get on Inside the Mainframe and nowhere else. And I think it's one of the most epic and unique sounding tracks I've ever made, even if it borrows so heavily from a downloadable demo. I don't have very many rock influence tracks, and this is one that I think utilizes those elements in the most fun way I've ever tried to incorporate them. I feel like I was actually really adding something to those demos that was more my own thing. As for other notable moments on this album, my other big favorite from here is probably Echo from the Earth. Although I will freely admit right down to the title that this track is kind of derivative, directly inspired by the work of Sounds from the Ground. The Electric Road's piano lines that comprise of the core groove of the track mainly stood out to me because they sound pretty similar to their track, The Cut. And there's this wailing trumpet sound at one point that kind of reminded me of their track, Planted. By the way, if you haven't heard their Mosaic or Terra Firma albums where these two tracks hail from, definitely make sure you do because that, that is excellent dub kill out is some of my favorites of all time. Though there are elements of this track that don't totally adhere to their formula, it brings in weird sitars and horn-centric samples that I wouldn't typically associate with them as much and the ever present of field recordings of crows and insects that they don't use, but, you know, gotta bring my own touches in some way. Even if the straight derivativeness isn't something I look as fondly upon now, the idea of making a track like one of theirs was so cool to me, it's one that I still have a fun ton of fun listening to. I think it's catchy and memorable enough to justify its existence. Not every track on here is as amazing as the last, though. I feel like I tried to make every single track on here a big epic experience in some way, and while I don't think I outright failed that mission on any tracks here, uh, some definitely stuck the landing better than others. Some tracks from the Blue Sunshine session uh, stick out to me in that way. 245 was initially titled as such because that's how long the first version was, <laughs> 2 minutes and 45 seconds. But the album version stretches it out to, like, twice its length. Anchor the Vibe It Creates is still pretty cool and justifies sticking around longer well enough, but I wonder how necessary a move that actually was, especially when it comes right after the very similar sounding The Cliff. That didn't change at all and just and uses its length just fine. I do really like the squeaky effects that play over most of that one. 
Uh, it's too. It sounds like something Pink Floyd would do in the 60s or something. I also mentioned Skyride. I think that one's also padded out a bit much. Although the original cut of that track was even worse. Like I said, it originally was just short of 10 minutes and that got pretty stale. But I do kind of like the soaring high atmosphere that it creates. And it's, it could have been... It could have been worse. I also think the actual track, Blue Sunshine, the ending here, is kind of a lackluster ending as well. It takes a while to really get going. And most of its best elements are done better in the opener, Clouds and Sky, which lets those parts breathe more and approaches them in a more subtle way. This works as an ending, bringing everything full circle, and that section that just layers like 10 different piano riffs from various old tracks of mine sounds pretty awesome. But it's never been a huge highlight, personally. Oh yeah, and this album also has the last track I ever composed on GarageBand, The Fifth Globe. It's pretty much just a moodier and sadder variation on hexagonal topography. Not a super original idea here, though I thought I think the emotion does come across pretty well. I think at that point I felt like I'd done everything that I could do with GarageBand and I was getting diminishing returns. The original version of the Fifth Globe had like three, four extra minutes of filler, intro and outro that weren't necessary. I'm kind of glad to have moved on from that software. As for the other moments on this album, Wrong Dimension is notable because uh, the original cut I did of it contained a straight sample of the orchestral session uh, from the hybrid track Dog Star. I thought it sounded absolutely amazing, but I was really worried about the legal ramifications of including it in there, despite the fact that these tracks otherwise sound nothing alike. Dog Star is a fast-paced orchestral breakbeat track, and Wrong Dimension is a weird, creepy ambient piece. I kind of life of Pablo the track a few times a few years ago, decided to decide whether or not should I include this despite it being against the law, because it is not cleared. But on the other hand, the track was not nearly as good when I outright removed it. Eventually, I think in 2016, when I was putting everything up on Spotify and iTunes and the like, I settled for making my own little string riff in FL Studio that sounded kind of similar, but wasn't the exact same, and I think that worked well enough. I do believe that is legal. And the only other tracks on here left to mention are Street Surfers, which I loved in 2013 but feels kinda awkwardly paced and not particularly memorable to me now. And finally, the actual track Infinity Minus 2, which is basically the one track on this album where I feel like the sound kinda matches the album title. I may as well say, Inside the Mainframe is kind of a misleading title in retrospect. You think you're going to get this cool electronic ambient thing that evokes some images of the technological future. And it doesn't even remotely try for that, for the most part. Instead, the concept I had in mind basically being some peaceful, expansive, virtual reality world that uses all these field recordings and elements from rock and jazz music that don't really match that computer-generated uh, title at all. It's ironically the album of mine that most reminds me of being in the actual outside world we live in. And Infinity Minus 2 is the one track that does kind of have that spacey technological vibe in pretty much any way. Maybe it'd work if you know, just know the basic plot of The Matrix or something and haven't actually watched the movie. But, um, it doesn't really utilize that concept much at all. Even Infinity Minus 2 has a lot of acoustic drumming and chugging guitars in it. But, you know, whatever. I still really like that track. Like, un like Unspoiled View, it's basically one big epic build-up, albeit changing and getting sidetracked a lot more often. It still comes off as a really epic, almost centerpiece of the album, if you want to call it that. It's the track with the most elements in it, and the longest one, too. But I don't really know if it's really the album's centerpiece, per se, since there are so many other tracks on it that aim for the same scale and scope. But hey, that lack of a centerpiece can be good too. No track really gets the focus above any other. So yeah, I think that's about all the insight I have to deliver on Inside the Mainframe. This is mostly egotistical rambling, but you know. This is an ambitious project to say the very least. I can see some people saying it's completely bloated, and some tracks get stale, don't always utilize their lengths to the best effect, and the title doesn't totally work either. I'm not gonna act like I think it's perfect myself, but I do have to appreciate it for how it does not hold back on anything. It's completely overindulgent in the most enjoyable way for me. I've always said that if you don't enjoy listening to the music you make, then you're not doing it right, and this is an album I personally enjoy listening to from front to back. It never drags or gets boring for me in spite of its indulgences. And I've even seen a fair few people who say it really worked for them and that they could really get into what a giant and expansive trip this album is, so 
I guess that makes the effort all the more worth it. Yeah.